All right, we're going to go ahead and jump in. <clears throat> we're going to talk this evening about uh, child and youth immersion. Now, thankfully, I would say in, in this congregation, child and youth immersion has never been a controversial issue. It's never been an issue at all. Um, you know, not that people have, have never had questions, but uh, basically, um, you have questions. Uh, they, they're explained, um, and they're explained satisfactorily, and uh, it's, it's moved on. But when we're talking about specifically objections to immersion and defending the faith, um, you, this one's a little bit different from the, speci- from the perspective of we're not specifically um, defending uh, an objection to immersion, but rather uh, we're, we're looking at a practice that, for whatever reason, has come to be within the Restoration Movement that never should have come to be. Um, you know, I thought, about, I thought about including all sorts of various, um, uh, various pictures uh, of Church of Christ websites with five-year-olds getting baptized uh, on the website, but I decided that might be a little, <laughs> that might be a little over the top, <laughs> so I'll just mention it now. Uh, and, but uh, I could have done that because uh, it is the case. I remember uh, a number of years ago, actually, um, uh, a number of years ago, I was looking at a, um, oh, I'm not going to even be able to, Lake James, a Lake James um, flyer, and Lake James has camps, um, kind of involved with the restoration movement, and they have camps, and they were talking about how their fourth through sixth grade camp was such a roaring success because they had a hundred plus baptisms into Jesus Christ. Okay, and it was it was really common. Okay, and so we gotta understand that this is common, and even if uh, in this room this isn't a controversial subject, your orbit wouldn't have to go very far outside of this room, and it becomes controversial really quickly. And there are real, real questions that need to be asked, and real questions that we that need to be answered. Um, and so we want to take a look at that uh, this evening. You know, we've established through. Uh, in this series in particular, what God's plan for man is. Again, God made the way uh, for man to be reconciled back to God, and man has a response to that way, right? God, God made it so that everyone can be saved, but is everyone saved? No. So there's, there's a requirement on man's behalf uh, that he has to meet. And so we examine that requirement in particular, and the Lord is serious about that plan really being executed. If you take a look at John chapter 14, and we use this a lot, but I think that it's important to use this in this context in particular. John 14. In verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, one of the things that that I want to point out here is that any other way, any other supposed way of salvation, okay, is trying to avoid Jesus. See, these are not these are not simply doctrinal disagreements. This is the difference between life and death. Jesus said, this is the way. If you are not willing to go in that way, what it is, is it is an an end around Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, if someone says, well, I reject what the Bible has to say about immersion, really what they're saying is, I reject Jesus Christ. You you can't get around that. And so... An unwillingness to submit to God's plan in any way uh, is a denial that Jesus really is the way. And so we talked about God's plan of salvation and we established that that he has created a way and we need to follow uh, that way. It's really uh, of, of tremendous importance. So since that way is so important, what about our kids? 
question does come up, and it's a good question. What about kids? If the way of salvation is a person needs to uh, believe, repent, confess, be immersed into Jesus Christ, and that within the new covenant today, that's how people are saved. What about children? I mean, we believe that people need to believe, repent, confess, and be immersed into Jesus Christ, right? So what about the kids? So do they need to submit to God's plan of salvation as well? Again, God is consistent, okay? And people are not going to be saved outside of the way that he has prescribed in his word. So I want to take a look as we start this out about what is it that God is really requiring. When we're talking about belief, repentance, confession, immersion into Jesus Christ, the question needs to be asked, what does belief require? What does belief require? See, is belief a simple affirmation? I believe that this is true. We could probably do an experiment. Um, I'm not going to do this to her, but we could probably do an experiment where I get uh, my daughter to repeat after me that she believes something. Okay? Now, it wouldn't much matter what that something was, right? I could just say, believe after me, and, you know, we, we could do that no problem. Okay? Does, does that have anything to do with her belief system? So that's another question. Is she capable of having a belief system? <laughs> not at all, right? Okay, so um, belief is a choice that has to be considered. Okay, belief is a choice that has to be considered. Our belief must be a personal belief. It cannot be anybody else's belief other than our own. And so this is highly, again, basic but it's highly significant when you think about some of the old Catholic practices of things like infant baptism. Can an infant believe? Certainly not, right? And so it's important to kind of think about these things and to think about what belief in Jesus uh, really is. Um, it also requires true ownership. Belief has to be your belief. It can't be somebody else's belief. It has to be a belief that you have and that you are willing to make a choice to act uh, upon. And so that's important because, again, a lot of times um, a belief that is too easily accepted is not really one's own. Right? And so, you know, I remember being... I don't know how old I was, four or five years old, maybe six, and we were on a, um, we were on a tour of Bethany College. Um, so we, at the, at, they used to have an All for Christ, uh, All for Christ uh, rally there. Um, many of you, who all went to the All for Christ? I know that there's actually quite a number of people here that were at All for Christ, and um, one of the things that they did a couple of years is that they would take tours then of Bethany College where like uh, Alexander Campbell, where all of his records and that sort of thing are stored, his house, his mansion, all of that uh, was in Bethany College. Do you remember the, the town, Mr. Harbor? Bethany, was it Bethany, yeah. West Virginia? It was about what? A few hours? Yeah, about an hour from Pittsburgh, about an hour and a half. So one of the things was really interesting uh, about that as I remember specifically we were around some of the Fagin boys and uh, I remember specifically you know me rattling off I was probably showing off or something but I was rattling off God's plan of salvation right this is no problem four or five six years old rattling off you know the five finger exercise you know and, and saying what that was right I remember another craft that we did in Sunday school where you know and again they they got the five finger exercise wrong as it was originally stated, but uh, the way that they were doing it was hear, believe, repent, confess, uh, be baptized into Jesus Christ, and then be faithful unto death. I had that memorized no problem at the age of five or six, but how great is that belief? That's what I was told. The training is good, the training is important, right? But I didn't own that belief. It's just what I was been told. 
right? And the same is true for our kids as, as they grow. Okay, we want that training, and we want to give them the ammunition to be able to, to develop a true belief, but that belief has to be theirs, okay? So then let's take a look at repentance. You know, a lot of times we'll define repentance from the Bible as a change in mind that leads to a change in action, okay? Now, certainly, <clears throat> well, let's, two thoughts here. Uh, a change in mind. Sometimes we call that a change in worldview, okay? Well, how many 12-year-olds you know that has a worldview? The worldview is, I want that toy. How can I play more video games on my parents' you know, phone? Or how can I uh, get more time on my video game system? Or um, you know, how can I watch some more TV? That's the worldview, right? That, that, that's about what we got for a worldview, OK? Because they're 12, OK? And so, <coughs> excuse me. A change in mind, which leads to a change in uh, action, requires there to be a paradigm shift. That is, the way that you view the world has to change. Well, for the way for you to view the world has to change, you have to view the world to begin with. They haven't even started to view the world, much less change the way that they need to view the world. And so, the idea of repentance is an important idea. Now. Is that to say that even two and a half year olds can't be naughty? Right? Of course not. Right? Hey, don't do this. You do it. They know, hey, I shouldn't have done that. Right? But <clears throat> that's not the same as good and evil. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. There's no repentance. There's no stain on the conscience. There's no sin whatsoever. And so a child is incapable of being able to change worldviews. Can't do it. Can't change worldviews. What about confession? We talked about belief. We talked about repentance. What about confession? Well, again, confession that Jesus is Lord sounds kind of simple, but there's actually a lot that's going on in our confession that Jesus is Lord. Not only are we saying Jesus is the King, but we are actually setting the course and setting the, uh, setting the direction for our entire lives with the statement that Jesus is Lord. You've got to understand that. What we're saying is that Jesus is the boss. Jesus is the King. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So, question. <clears throat> Kids that are not even the boss of themselves, how can they decide that Jesus is going to be the boss of them? They don't have the right to make that decision. They can't do it. Okay, And that's one of the things that is, is a hint for you, that if the parent ever has a part in the decision-making process, the kid is too young. Now, there are even some people on our, our side of the youth immersion issue that would take issue with that. But you kind of think about it. If it's a joint decision, then they don't have full sovereignty over the decisions that they're making. And without full sovereignty, you can't give sovereignty. And Jesus is Lord. Okay? And so an individual has to have a choice over their lives uh, to adhere to the sovereignty of Christ. So confession that Jesus is Lord, yeah, again, we can coach any of our young people that we want to to just make the statement that Jesus is Lord or Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's really different than biblical confession. It's going to take an adult-level mind to biblically confess that Jesus is Lord. Well, what about immersion into Jesus Christ? You actually can do this quite young. You go through the process pretty easy, you know. I mean, again, in a lot of ways, in, immersion into Jesus Christ is one of the most passive parts of our conversion process. And we have to be actively involved, right? But especially if they're little, they don't have to be that active. <laughs> you can bustle them down, right? No problem. <clears throat> so... And we think about immersion into Jesus Christ, just because they can go through the motions 
does not mean that they understand what is actually taking place in the waters of immersion. Okay? Again, what's taking place in the waters of immersion is the death of an old man and the resurrection of a new man. Well, it's kind of interesting, even within those terms, right? Man, kind of interesting. Uh, but uh, something there that is that is um, is you know when we we're, we're talking about immersion into Jesus Christ, okay? For someone to be reconciled back to God, they have to be away from God. Said another way, okay? For a person to be saved, they must first be lost. They must first be lost. And so, immersion into Jesus Christ is the place where, okay, a person is going from uh, outside of Christ to inside of Christ. A person is the death of the old man and a resurrection of the brand new man. Again, what we see is that there is an adult level mind that is uh, required. So, when we think about the status of children, if children are not able to follow the steps of salvation, what is their spiritual status? Okay, and so we're going to get into spiritual status uh, in just a second here. But I'll go ahead and open it up for questions just regarding um, the steps of God's plan of salvation as it relates to children and their ability or inability to be able to follow those steps. Does anybody have any comments, thoughts, questions? Mr. Tuck. If you're going to be going there, you yeah. stop please. But, you know, another area that I think is very relevant when it comes to looking at how young someone is being immersed in Christ is the fact that becoming a Christian is becoming part of the church. The church is the bride of Christ. We are going there. Yep, yep, you're absolutely right. Yep. So, um, what's the scriptural status of children? Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel 18, verse 20. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment of the, uh, for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. For the righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. So, the son is not going to bear the sin of the father. Okay? The son is not responsible for the father's sin or the father's iniquity. Therefore, okay, that sin is not, cannot be passed down from one generation to another uh, generation. Um, we see here in uh, Ezekiel that it says, The soul who sins shall die. One of the things that is going to be a little bit of a theme as we, as we move forward is that you are personally, personally responsible for the sins that you commit. There has to be a committing of sin or a transgression on your part okay, for that sin to count against you. You have to do it. Okay? Which you have to do it, is, and the New Testament is actually really consistent with this. You have to do it, and you have to know that you're doing it. Okay? And so... <clears throat> What, what we have is that, that sin is not passed from father to son. Uh, it makes sense with God's character, but if we take a look as well at uh, Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Um, let's do 3 through 6, and then let's do 10 as well. Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, the kingdom of heaven is the church, right? You've got to become like children. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, 
He is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be uh, drowned in the depth of uh, the sea. Um, So uh, if you take a look then at verse 10, See to it that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. So, their angels in heaven uh, continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven, but they're, um, but they're depraved little sinners. Does that, does that make any sort of sense? Okay. Become like children. Okay. So Jesus is certainly indicating to us the status of children. If you turn over to Matthew 19, verses 13 through 15. Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the children alone, and do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to to such as these. After laying his hands on them, he departed from there. Again, we should probably infer something from these scriptures. Jesus is welcoming of the children. Jesus is protective of the children. Jesus says, hey, you want to know something about being great in the kingdom of heaven? Become one of, like one of these kids. So what's that tell you about the status of those kids? Not, not that they're depraved little sinners, that's for sure. So you know, we, should, we should kind of be thinking about some of these things. Now, the strongest passage of Scripture, in my estimation, uh, concerning this is Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. We're going to read uh, verses 7 through 11. Romans 7, 7 through uh, 11. Now remember... Uh, Paul wrote, um, Paul penned the um, uh, book of Romans. Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So, Paul is discussing the law here. And he's talking about how the law has said, Thou shalt not covet. And how the law, in and of itself... The law was fine. The law was perfect. There was no trouble with the law. However, what did the law produce in man? What's he looking at? Coveting. What's he focused on? Coveting. What happens when you look at and you focus on the law? Even God's law. Okay? You end up doing the thing that you're looking at. And so, what he says is that sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. Now, what's interesting here in verse 9 is he says, I was once alive apart from the law. Question. Okay? We don't know exactly when uh, Paul was born. It seems to me from, from my study, my reading of the scriptures, he would have been one of the younger apostles of Jesus Christ. So he's, you know, he's born sometime, I don't know, between 1 and 15 AD, let's say, just for round figures. Not round, but, uh, you know, he, so by fives, fives are nice, right? Uh, so, um, so we take a look at that, and the law was instituted at 1450 BC. 
That's a long time before 1580. So, how was he alive apart from the law? Well, clearly he's alive apart from the law because the law did not personally apply to him until he reached a certain point. We might call that point the age of accountability. Okay? So there is a point at which the law does not personally apply to the Apostle Paul. But the commandment came, sin became alive, and what? He died. He followed the same path everybody else who's gotten to the age of accountability follows for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of the God and Jesus Christ accepted. Okay? And so <clears throat> Paul, the commandment became alive and he died. So basically, there is a time where the law did not apply to Paul. He was alive apart from the law. That's exactly what we have with our little ones. Right? They are alive apart from the law. Okay? And without the law, uh, sin is dead, it says there in verse uh, 8. So <clears throat> Paul uh, was alive apart from the law, just like our little ones are uh, apart from the law. The conclusion is clear. There was a time in Paul's life as a child that the law did not apply to him. He was alive, the commandment came, sin became alive, and he died. We really see the maturation process here. He is alive spiritually. That is, he is in fellowship with God. Okay, one thing to note here, you can, you can tell really quickly, okay, that that does not mean that he had the Holy Spirit. Okay, I have heard of people getting that wrong, okay, before. Okay, it doesn't mean that he had God's Holy Spirit indwelling within him. But there's no sin, so there's no separation between him and God. The best way, the best example that I can kind of think of is this kind of like Adam and Eve uh, pre-fall. This kind of relationship that children have with God. Children have his ear. He's listening to their prayers. They're innocent before him. Okay? They don't have an understanding of good and evil. Okay? And so those children are acceptable to God because the law has not become alive to them uh, yet. But the maturation process does happen, okay? and um, law becomes alive, uh, the law applies, uh, he sins uh, and dies. Uh, Paul was born innocent, uh, and so are uh, our children. Let's go to Romans chapter 14 real quick. Romans 14. Romans 14 and verse 12. So then each one of us shall give account of himself to God. You're going to give account of yourself to God. There's an accounting that's going to take place, and that accounting is between uh, you and God. One of the things that we see is that there's personal responsibility. Okay? And so God is a, God is a benevolent God. God is a just God. And you think about if, if people are born sinners, what does that say about the justice of God? You really think about what does that say about God if people are born sinners? Okay? So children are innocent before the Lord and continue in innocent until the, uh, the commandment uh, becomes all that's supposed to be alive. I should probably edit that. Uh, sin becomes alive and the individual uh, dies. Okay? So, the next question that we are going to answer then is, uh, um, well, we're going to get into scriptural examples here in a second, but um, we're going to answer the question, uh, when, when does that take place uh, here in just a second? But any questions, comments about the status of children being innocent before the Lord? Nothing? Okay. So, one of the things we want to take a look, because there will be some objections that will come up, and so we want to take a look at a few scriptural examples. One of the things that we want to note is that there is not a single scriptural account of children being immersed into Jesus Christ. Challenge you to find it. Okay? 
show me where there is an example. We're supposed to be the New Testament church, right? So show me a New Testament example where we see a child being immersed into Jesus Christ. You can't show it to me. Okay, I'm getting to that. Okay, so we doesn't exist. Okay, so uh, the Bible records adult men being immersed into Christ. It re records adult women being immersed into Christ. There's not one scriptural example of children being immersed into Christ. As Mr. Harbour just indicated, what about households? There are examples of households being immersed into Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you that that question really does not even come into consideration here. Okay? We want to think about it from the perspective of, if you take the biblical principles that are there, okay, then um, we want to be asking the questions, who's making the assumption? Let's use, let's actually use a biblical uh, example that, everybody from the restoration movement would agree upon okay let's go to acts 22 well i shouldn't say everybody from the restoration movement we've seen that <laughs> that's very much not the case but okay acts 22 i would say that that the audience that you're probably talking with would be sympathetic towards so let's let's put it that way acts 22 and remember verse 16, right? We've gone over this in a lot of detail. Right? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling upon his name. So we know that he's still in his sins until he's immersed into Jesus Christ. We do remember going over that, right? Everybody? We good? Okay, good. I got some nods. So let's look at 22 and verse 12. And a certain Ananias, a man who is devout by the standard of the law... And well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near me said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time, I looked up at him. Okay, so Brother Saul, receive your sight, right? Now, we know that he's still in his sins at this point in verse uh, 13 there. And yet Ananias calls him brother. So does the scripture contradict itself? No, he's not going to call anybody who's in his sins still brother, right? So in what sense are Ananias and Saul brothers? This is pretty simple. What sense are Ananias and Paul brothers? They're both Jews, right? They are literally, physically, well, I should be careful with literally there. They're physically, they're related so he's calling him Brother Saul. Okay? So, you have to make an assumption that is contrary to Scripture to try to read in that he's calling him brother as in brother in Christ, aren't you? In exactly the same way, you have to do that with household when it comes to the children uh, making the case that children are having to be immersed into Jesus Christ. You can't do it. Number one, children are never specifically recorded as being immersed into Jesus Christ. They aren't. So then we have to take the other principles, and when we take the other principles, we see that children are innocent before God. So when we say household, it's kind of like a math problem, right? And you're putting people in different groups, and you say everybody in this group was immersed into Jesus Christ. All of the accountable adults in the household were immersed into Jesus Christ. But the scripture wouldn't make some sort of differentiation there because that would just add more confusion. Of course kids aren't immersed into Christ. So why would it say all of the household, excepting the 12 children that they had, well, of course not. Children are innocent before God. And we've got to remember that Jewish households, they're going to consist of a number of different people. You might think mom, dad, kids, that's a household, right? But in that day and in society, and, you know, now that kids can be on their parents' health care up to 27 years old, okay? Uh, there's, there's household, the, the definition of household expansion is there, right? And, and what you would have back in this day is you would have probably grandparents, 
You would have mom and dad. You would have perhaps brothers and sisters of mom and dad, aunt and uncles of the kids. You would have servants and slaves. That's who we're talking about with the entire household. And so to read anything about children into the passages, and there's a number of them, about households being immersed into Jesus Christ, you have to make an extra biblical assumption. And that extra biblical assumption actually goes against all of the principles and precepts that are laid out about children in the New Testament. I don't want to be making that kind of assumption. I think that kind of assuming is very dangerous. You know, there are Lydia and her household, Acts 16, 15. Stephanus and his household, 1 Corinthians 1, 16. Uh, the Philippian jailer and his household, Acts 16, 33. But there's a number of different people that would have been included in that household. And I'm telling you that consistent with Scripture, uh, there's, there's no way that children were a part of uh, those uh, households. Okay? Only those who uh, were immersed, uh, only, of those, um, only those to whom immersion applied would need to be immersed. If it doesn't apply to you, no problem, right? I mean, and, and this isn't, I'm not saying this to be derogatory uh, because there's, there's certainly a significant difference, but I would like you to kind of think about the idea of groups not being uh, part of it, right? Again, your pets are part of your household. And again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to be facetious and I'm not equating children to pets. I, I hope you all understand where I'm coming from there. But the group that it doesn't apply to, you wouldn't talk about that group because it just doesn't apply. And so different groups doesn't apply. Okay? And so we have to understand that there... It talks about adult men, adult women. You can get into the Greek of all of that, and we talk about you know, what the Bible is defining as young men. You can actually get into some of those things specifically. Um, that's not what we're trying to do in the scope of uh, this study in particular. So we're going to talk about age of accountability here in a second, but any questions at this point or comments? Dennis. Right. But, you know, I think that's a, it becomes difficult to explain that to somebody who doesn't understand the whole biblical part of that, you know, child. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, we'll get to your call in just a second. You know, where I would respond to that is there is a difference between hearing the law and the law becoming alive. You know, again, that would be very similar to getting one of the little ones to repeat. You know, they're, told, they're telling them, you know, Deuteronomy 6, you know, hey, from a very young age, you pound this in, right? But just because you've heard something doesn't mean that you have internalized it for the law to become alive. Mr. Harbor. Well, I think that, you know, that is a continuum of process, teaching the child the law, but at the point the law becomes alive, I think we're giving some indicators of that when they're going in to, um, to uh, uh, Joshua's going in to take the land yep. of promise, they exempt all of the men under 20 years old. Now, I'm not going to say that 20 years old is any kind of a magic age, but it's older even than, than the people who would generally be against infant immersion. Right. Then, then, so there is there is an indicator where God was drawing the line in the Old Testament, which ought to give us a clue that at the end of that continuum may be a lot later than what we think about academically learning about the law. Certainly, and I think that that's those are the principles that you've got to 
pour into the mix, right? To, those are the factors that you do need to be considering. Uh, absolutely, and we'll be talking about some of those here in a second. What well, else? Certainly the, certainly the marriage analogy, too, I think is a good analogy. If you want to teach your kids how to be good husbands and wives, but they're not eligible for marriage on that continuum until it, at some point when they are accountable for themselves. Yeah, I know that's a good point. We're, we'll talk about marriage, but I think in this particular, is the difference between hearing about marriage and receiving marriage. Right, yeah. You didn't hear about marriage right. from, you know, little girls are planning their wedding from about the age of four, right? So, you know, but but what do we have? Uh, that's different than receiving marriage or understanding marriage. Right, and you still enter into it with an element of interest. Right. Yeah. Again, that isn't to say. Well, it's true. Yeah. Uh, then there's a sense, in, and there's a sense in which the adult level mind, right? The adult level mind, even when we are entering into Christ, do we understand the uh, the full meaning of that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot that you, a lot that you learn as you go, right? So this isn't <clears throat> this. Uh, that certainly uh, is the case as well. Anything else there, Ryan? I find it interesting that the household argument. Yeah. You know, like, uh, you know, the scripture is very clear that you know, it's constructed it so that. Mm -hmm. a lot of time that an age is always what most people go with the argument is 20, 12, whatever, yeah. the eight day, whatever you want to, it's, it's this, they want to label it a point, and it's, I know you're probably going to get into a little bit of this, but it's like, that's different for everybody. Right. And I always find myself like, what do you answer? It's like, it's for everybody. No right. Problem. I don't know when people are going to decide to make a decision. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's and it is there are a number of factors that that play into that. And that's one of the things that I kind of end with. And we can kind of jump ahead just a little bit here. But like there certainly are cultural considerations uh, for us to have. Right. And so uh, let's think about the United States, say, 150, 200 years ago. The average 13 year old in the United States going to be more mature than the average 13 year old today. Yeah. Is that overall a good thing? I'm not so sure that that's actually a good thing. I'm actually kind of glad that our boys get better than an eighth grade education. You know, get, get to be in school past the age of 13. Again, I don't know if the education on the whole is, is, is as good as it was maybe 150 or 200 years ago. Okay, but there's, so if we take it back 2,000 years, you know, a Jewish boy who's 15, it'll look different than an American boy who's 15, right? But we do need to consider some of those things, okay, and consider what culture and what time that we specifically uh, live in as well. So let's get into some of these, uh, some of these uh, things to consider about the age of accountability. There, it's not a one-size-fits-all. As Ryan was pointing out, it's not the age of 12. It's not the age of 20. You know, it's, it's clearly there's some things that are... There are some things that are put in the scriptures there to, to help us to think about principles, but the scripture never lays a specific uh, age. Um, in fact, there are those who never, become, never have an adult mind to be able to reach that age of accountability. So how could God put an age in there when there are people who will never mentally reach the state where they become accountable to God? So that lets you know, too, about those who have mental deficiencies to the point where they can't get there. We're going we're gonna to see them in heaven. There's no problem, right? And so uh, God's not going to put a fine point on it because it is individual. It is personal. Um, what factors should we consider concerning the age of accountability? As we started out, obviously a person has to be able to uh, complete God's plan of salvation. What are some other factors to be considered? Well... The scripture uh, describes a Christian as married to Christ. Okay? Married to Christ. Well, you talk about marriage relationship, and the marriage relationship really is about, I would say, the, the second most important decision that you're ever going to make is who it is that you get married to. Oh, well, what's the most important decision? Well, whether you're going to be immersed into Jesus Christ or not, whether you're going to be a Christian. And so we certainly uh, would not allow 
in our day, in our culture, we would not say, oh yes, let's all encourage our 15-year-old girls to be wed. That's not what we would do, right? That's right. <laughs> That's not what we would do. <laughs> so um, uh, we want to make sure, uh, you know, when we're talking about the marriage relationship, the marriage relationship has responsibilities. Well, if the marriage relationship has responsibilities, does our covenant with the Lord have responsibilities? Covenant with the Lord certainly has responsibilities, and those responsibilities need to be entered into by an adult-level mind, someone who is making a lifelong commitment to Christ. Bring in, bring in a, a Marshall story here. At the age of six, my lovely parents, sitting right over there for anybody who needs them pointed out, made me sign a contract when they bought a Clavinova piano that was less than $500, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, And the contract stated okay, that I would continue to take piano lessons until I was 18 years old. Now, I was six. <laughs> it would not hold up in court. And I will have you know that by the time I was 16, I was done with piano lessons. Okay? We traded piano for basketball, and I have never regretted it. Okay? Um, so, legally, okay, there's a reason why contracts aren't enforceable until somebody's 18. They have no idea how to make a responsible decision. Okay? And so what we have is a marriage commitment to Jesus Christ where a person, uh, where a person is, um, is joining themselves with Christ. It's interesting that, again, some of this has, we don't want to Americanize it too much. I understand that. But, you know, it's interesting that in our day, and it's different state by state, but if a young person wants to get married prior to 18, what has to happen first? What's that? Have to get parents' permission. They have to be emancipated, right? Is it, well, isn't that interesting? That even the legal system says, if you think that you want to do this marriage thing, we need a sign-off from your parents. Or you need to say, uh, nope, I'm, I'm not under their authority. Okay? And so... Our marriage to Christ, Ephesians chapter 5, we're not going to go over that, but if you go 22 through about 33, you'll be able to see that. Christians are also referred to as soldiers of Christ. Okay? Well, question on a couple of different levels. Okay? Uh, what, kind of, what kind of society or what kind of culture would send their little ones out there to go fight in their wars? Okay? So... In the Lord's army, you better be ready to fight. Not being trained to be fight you to fight. You better be ready to fight. And so, uh, the training starts when the kids are, you know, in the womb. Hopefully, it's when the training starts. Okay, but <clears throat> the actual fighting part of it, we probably want to wait a little bit for that. Okay? And so, as soldiers of Christ, this is adults. And this goes back to one of the points that Mr. Harbour was making. If you take a look at the Levitical priesthood, you can look it up in uh, 1 Chronicles, it's between chapters 20 and 30. Uh, if, you look, if you look it up, um, you see that the Levites didn't start serving until they were 20 years old. Had to be 20 before you started. What about... Uh, those who are held responsible for the faith, uh, faithlessness of Israel, right? Joshua and Caleb got to go in, and who? Those who were under 20 got to go in. So who is God holding responsible for their actions? Okay? So, in the sen uh, another thing in the Old Testament, okay, the census, who did the census count? Those who were 20 and above. The adults. Okay? And so, again, 
20 is not the age. I've, I've, heard, I've heard of people also being strict about 20. That's not what I'm saying at all, and I don't think that that's at all what the Bible teaches. But if we're starting to get a range, okay, then I think that 20 is a good place to start the conversation. Not, I, I would say I'd not recommend a good place to end the conversation, but I think it's a good place to start the conversation. And as a priest, again, these are not child priests running around here. We're talking about people who are able to perform their priestly duties. So when we, when we take a look at that, we're going to really come to a conclusion that we're talking about adult-level minds making adult-level decisions who truly know the difference between good and evil. And so when we're talking about the age of accountability, I understand parents' concern. We want to make sure that our little ones make it. Okay? But it is much much more dangerous to immerse our children too early okay, than to make sure that they have the time that they know that it is their decision that they are making. Much more dangerous to immerse them too early. And I could make the case in a number of different ways uh, for that. Um, comments, questions? Last slide. Knowledge of good and evil. There's a significant difference between right and wrong and good and evil. Old Testament example of those who went in the promised land. Note that this is just an example, not a prescribed age, and there are various factors to be considered in our day and time as well. You know, and again, those factors are more subjective and change, uh, change culture to culture. And so that's one of those things that, of course, the Bible is not going to give specific examples of that. It's going to give the principle like the age of 20. You know, some of the factors that I think about is, okay, are they living in their parents' house? Uh, some of the factors that I think about um, are, are they driving? Are they, are they making their own decisions? Are they responsible for their own finances? You know, are, are they emotionally independent? Like what, what, you know, those are the factors that you consider. And then, like I said, basically, you know, uh, a principle uh, is if, if you can stop, especially as a parent, if you can stop your child from getting immersed, then, then that tells you that they're not really accountable. Okay. So any closing thoughts or questions, comments on any of this? Mr. Arbor. in those congregations have been immersed as youth. And so when you start to get them to think about their own salvation, their own immersion, and the legitimacy of it, you're going to get a lot of pushback on that. Now, one of the things that, that has been you know, said to me was that, you know, well, I was immersed at a young age, and, you know, the idea that, well, you know, Grandma was married when she was 14, and and her and grandpa stayed together, but but we have to realize that that's in spite of, not because of. Sure. I'm not saying that it's completely illegitimate, but it doesn't make it any easier. Right. And oftentimes it is completely illegitimate because you didn't have those other factors in in, in place. But that's the person's decision. But to get up and teach what you just taught in most mainline churches of Christ would get you crucified before we got out of here sure. because you will have enough people in the because camps and, and that sort of thing has concentrated on their success being how many kids, how many juveniles that they immerse. You know, I, I got in a lot of trouble at Ludlow uh, um, Falls because they wanted to immerse uh, Irene. She's 14 years old, learning disabled, and I have been working with Irene for months to get her to read one chapter a week through Mark, and she couldn't, she couldn't do it. And they come to me crying in the middle of the night because they've got her emotionally worked up and they want to go immerse her, and I said, they not. Yeah. Well, what if, she never, what if she never gets to this place again? Well, then it proves I was right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, they acted like, oh, well, you know, you better get this done while she's at the place to do it because then it'll count. No, it doesn't. Right. You can't fool somebody into a covenant and then hold them to that covenant. Right. They just can't. Right. You know, so. No, I think those are tremendous points. And it really does give you a picture of the grace that we need to show as we're presenting this, but then also the perspective that they're coming from. I'm glad you shared that story about Ludlow Falls because it, it shows you a lot of these youth camps that it really is pretty lazy because the idea is we're going to send our kids and they're going to, you know, your kids are sleep deprived by the end of the week, okay? No matter what camp you send them to, okay? Uh, and it's pretty easy to manipulate uh, kids. And so it's dishonest, it's manipulative, and it's lazy. And that's what we're calling victory. <laughs> right, yeah, 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 yep, absolutely. No, and I appreciate, too, um, you know, a lot of... You brought up Russell, right? You appreciate those who who were presented with what the, the Bible says. I'm going to go with what that says. I'm going to make sure. I'm not going to let my pride get in the way. I'm going to make sure that I do what the Bible says and get this thing right. You know, appreciate that kind of faith, and that's the kind of faith that God's really that God's really looking for. Just to give you another Ludlow Falls story, I remember one of the guys at Ludlow Falls. I was 10 or 11 years old. He asked for volunteers for prayer. Put my hand up. He's like, oh, Marshall, that's great. Have you been, have you been baptized yet? We're going to go with another kid. Okay? Let you know where they're at. Okay? And so, again, you've got you to gotta understand that, that is, that's the reality of most of the restoration movement and why we do need to bring this with some grace, because there is, uh, you know, there's certainly family factors to be considered, and uh, individuals are going to have to look at their own lives, their own ministries, and, and evaluate those things that are very personal to them. And the question is, would you rather get that right or be wrong on the day of judgment? Any other thoughts, comments? All right, let's go ahead and stand up.